Hi, I'm Rashonda Cade. This is Reading with Rashonda. We're reading Clotel by William Wells Brown. We're wrapping up chapter 26 today, and we are, we are in the home stretch. We're getting there. One morning, George arrived on the banks of the Ohio River and found his journey had terminated unless he could get someone to take him across the river in a secret manner, for he would not be permitted to cross in any of the ferry boats, it being a penalty for crossing a slave, besides the value of the slave. He concealed himself in the tall grass and weeds near the river to see if he could embrace an opportunity to cross. He had been in his hiding place but a short time when he observed a man in a small boat floating near the shore, evidently fishing. His first impulse was to call out to the man and ask him to take him over to the Ohio side, but the fear that the man was a slaveholder or one who might possibly arrest him deterred him from it. The man, after rowing and floating about for some time, fastened the boat to the root of a tree and started to a neighboring farmhouse. This was George's moment, and he seized it. Running down the bank, he unfastened the boat, jumped in, and with all the expertness of one accustomed to a boat, rowed across the river and landed on the Ohio side. <sighs> Being now in a free state, he thought he might, with perfect safety, travel on towards Canada. He had, however, gone but a very few miles when he discovered two men on horseback coming behind him. He felt sure that they could not be in pursuit of him, yet he did not wish to be seen by them, so he turned into another road leading to a house nearby. The men followed and were but a, sh and were but a short distance from George when he ran up to a farmhouse, before which was standing a farmer-looking man in a broad-brimmed hat and straight-collared coat, who he implored to save him from the slave catchers. The farmer told him to go into the barn nearby. He entered by the front door, the farmer following, and closing the door behind George, but remaining outside, and gave directions to his hired man as to what should be done with George. The slaveholders by this time had dismounted and were in front of the barn demanding admittance and charging the farmer with secreting their slave woman, for George was still in the dress of a woman. The friend, for the farmer proved to be a member of the Society of Friends, told the slave owners that if they wished to search his barn, they must first get an officer and a search warrant. While the parties were disputing, the farmer began nailing up the front door, and the hired man served the back door in the same way. The slaveholders, finding that they could not prevail on the friend to allow them to get the slave, determined to go in search of an officer. One was left to see that the slave did not escape from the barn, while the other went off at full speed to Mount Pleasant, the nearest town. George was not the slave of either of these men, nor were they in pursuit of him, but they had lost a woman who had been seen in that vicinity, and when they saw poor George in the disguise of a female and attempting to elude pursuit, they felt sure they were close upon their victim. However, if they had caught him, although he was not their slave, they would have taken him back and placed him in jail, and there he would have remained until his owner arrived." After an absence of nearly two hours, the slave owner returned with an officer and found the friend still driving large nails into the door. In a triumphant tone and with a corresponding gesture, he handed the search warrant to the friend and said, There, sir, now I will see if I can't get my nigger. Well, said the friend, thou hast gone to work according to law, and thou canst now go into my barn. Lend me your hammer that I may get the door open, said the slaveholder. Let me see the warrant again. And after reading it over once more, he said, I see nothing in this paper which says I must supply thee with tools to open my door. If thou wishest to go in, thou must get a hammer elsewhere. <sighs> the sheriff said, I will go to a neighboring farm and borrow something which will introduce us to Miss Dinah. And he immediately went in search of tools. In a short time, the officer returned, and they commenced an assault and battery upon the barn door, which soon yielded, and in went the slaveholder and officer, and began turning up the hay and using all other means to find the lost property. But, to their astonishment, the slave was not there. After all their hope of getting Dinah was gone, the slave owner, in a rage, said to the friend, "'My nigger is not here!' I did not tell thee there was any one here. Yes, but I saw her go in, and you shut the door behind her, and if she was not in the barn, what did you nail the door for? Can't I do what I please with my own barn door? Now I will tell thee, thee need trouble thyself no more, for the person thou art after entered the front door, and went out at the back door, and is a long way from here by this time. 
Thou and thy friend must be somewhat fatigued by this time. Won't thou go in and take a little dinner with me? We need not say that this cool invitation of the good Quaker was not accepted by the slaveholders. George, in the meantime, had been taken to a friend's dwelling some miles away, where, after laying aside his female attire, and being snugly dressed up in a straight-collared coat and pantaloons to match, was again put on the right road towards Canada. The fugitive now traveled by day and laid by during night. After a fatiguing and dreary journey of two weeks, the fugitive arrived in Canada and took up his abode in the little town of St. Catharines and obtained work in the farm of, Col of Colonel Street. Here he attended a night school and labored for his employer during the day. The climate was cold and wages were small, yet he was in a land where he was free. And this the young slave prized more than all the gold that could be given to him. Besides doing his best to obtain education for himself, he imparted what he could to those of his fellow fugitives about him, of whom there were many. Alright, today's reading was pretty short. Yeah, oh, can we get... Yeah, I'm not going to read the next chapter. We're just going to have a short day today. Alright, so that wrapped up chapter 26 of Clotel by William Wells Brown. We have left chapter 27, which is only a few pages chapter 28 which is more than a few pages and chapter 29 the conclusion whoo we are almost done it's been a long journey i'm glad you've joined me on it i'm rashonda Cade, and this is reading with rashonda